Welcome to the show. I've got some exciting news that I just can't hold in anymore. Today, I just learned that this show has been awarded diamond medallion status. I mean, look, technically it's me, but I could not have done any of it without the hard work of all the people who make it possible for me to get on an airplane. I'm talking production accountants, I'm, I'm talking, wait, 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 what are you doing? No, 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 we still have a whole show to do. Come on, tonight I want to talk about aviation. You might be wondering, Wyatt, how did you pull this off? Well, I saw that I was getting close to diamond status, so I booked 12 round trip flights from New York to Atlanta in a single weekend. The airline, they were running a special, and I think I could petty cash it. Am I constipated? Oh my God, like you wouldn't believe. Have my ears popped? I said, have my ears popped. Was it worth it? Yes. And look, I'm not the only one who takes drastic measures to rack up points from airline companies. We're called mileage runners, but those that don't understand us call us freaks. And you know what I say to that? Let the freaks fly. Freaks. Airline mileage programs incentivize air travel. That may be part of the reason the rate of airline travel is increasing. One report predicts the amount of individual passenger flights will reach 4.6 billion this year. And the global fleet of airplanes could double in the next two decades, which is why on my seventh trip to Atlanta, I found myself in an altered state that some of the older freaks call inner turbulence. I started wondering, how responsible are my flying habits? Air travel currently accounts for around 2% of global CO2 emissions. And that may seem small, but if the aviation industry was a country, it would be a top 10 global emitter. And experts say that 2% could jump to 22% by 2050. So when you think about it, all this mileage running that I'm doing is actually really fucked up. Ooh, hold on. Wait. If I took another flight, I could get to emerald status? Uh, hold on a second. I just need to go to the bathroom. On an airplane! O okay, yeah, I did take another flight. But it was to double my miles. I mean, yeah, I'm traveling a lot. Ooh. Hold, please. At least I'm not flying private. One hour on a private jet burns as much fuel as an entire year of driving. And I'm only flying long distances because airplanes use the most fuel at takeoff. So the shorter the flight, the less efficient it is, which is why I would never take a flight from like New York to Boston, or really anywhere to Boston. Don't go to Boston. Paid for by the Boston Tourism Board. Chowder. At least I fly coach on my mileage runs, because one study found that the carbon footprint for first class travel could be nine times higher than for someone in coach. And I never use the bathroom when I fly, because I don't want anything that gets flushed to land on a bird. I don't poop on birds, and they don't poop on me. It's all part of the Deuce Truce Accords of 1979. <laughs> so taking all that into account, I'm not the worst in regards to my carbon footprint. But also, why should it all be on me? I'm just a simple rube who got caught up in the allure of racking up numbers that correspond to a mineral-based caste system. Private companies, they're the ones incentivizing behavior that's bad for the environment without doing nearly enough to offset their own carbon footprints. If I take this flight, I could get to grand Adirite status, which means I get to board before the flight is even deplaned. As amazing as that sounds, though, I'd just be playing into the airline's hands. See, this is the problem with airlines. The whole business thrives on encouraging behavior that's bad for the environment. I mean, if we really want to change people's habits, maybe travel should be incentivized differently. Like, what if instead of frequent flyer programs that focus on racking up miles flying, we just made a universal mileage program. You know, where people would be rewarded for how small of a carbon footprint they create however they get to a destination. You want to keep diamond status? Take a train instead of a plane. 
Why shouldn't a person be able to be a freak wherever they go? Freaks. You should get to be a freak on a bus. Freaks. Or a freak just walking down the sidewalk. Freaks. And you might say, why? What's the perk of being a diamond status freak Freaks. when you're just walking down the sidewalk? Same as diamond status for flying. You get to board early, all the alcohol's free, traffic cops have to offer you warm cookies, not to mention the hot towels. Oh, yes, the hot towels. Oh, so hot. So, so, so very hot. So hot. Hot, 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 but these safe havens for the sensitive and fecally vigorous have seen a decline. The rise of online retailers like Amazon drove many brick-and-mortar bookstores out of business. But there is one place where bookstores still thrive. Airports. Many civilizations governed by the rules of silver-winged gods. Airport bookstores succeed because travelers demand entertainment, meaning there's another place bookstores could thrive. Consider the Subway Bookstore. Tapping into a whole new market of word-thirsty commuters, the Subway Bookstore would thrill the customer, who could now savour every word that transports them far from their boring commute. Like that word. Subway cars could save the bookstore. And the best part? They're already used as public restrooms. Oh no, not on the train. Thinking back to when I was in school, the cafeteria was the place that first introduced me to capitalism. Those lunch tables were a trading room floor where a seventh grader could walk in with an egg salad sandwich and walk out with the keys to a brand new Porsche. Awesome. To this day, my 401k is mainly just fruit roll-ups I've been saving. I don't think they ever go bad and there's always demand. Point is, a lot of a student's experience can depend on what goes on in the cafeteria. So let's talk about school lunch. The cafeteria serves an important purpose in a school when you consider that according to one survey, three out of four teachers say they see students who are regularly coming to school hungry. That fourth teacher doesn't really see it because they let their students eat glue, which really takes the edge off. You first have to make sure that the kids have their basic needs met, that they have food. Kids who are hungry in class, just like athletes who are hungry at practice, don't perform as well. It's not a small thing to make sure that they've had breakfast, lunch, dinner, it is really the first thing that matters when we're talking about kids' education. Given that it matters so much, it's kind of odd that school lunch often winds up with the shittiest Yelp reviews. School lunch is not that good. School lunches are terrible. <laughs> bad pizza, bad chicken McNuggets, french fries every single day. It literally comes from like a five-day trip frozen in a truck. I can see the disgust in your face, and it's in my face too. I never ate it. That kind of gross cafeteria food is what creates a snack pack shadow economy. And while that helps some kids profit, it also means that a lot of kids just wind up eating junk or skipping meals altogether. Making sure that all kids have access to quality food is something the city of Minneapolis has had to confront. And I know that I said I wasn't going to go on any more mileage runs, but this isn't that. But to be eco-friendly, I won't use the air conditioning. I'll just open the windows on the flight. So, see you in the land of 10,000 lakes. Going to school, you had to get like food. What would you wind up doing? It was like either the banana now later and like maybe some hot chips. And definitely. That was your breakfast? Yeah. Banana and hot, and hot, hot chips? Hot chips in the brisk tea, because that was in at the time. Now, I Mom, you're hearing this. Like, what, <laughs> what's going on? And she's outside the house, and she's, she thinks banana now and later is, is a fruit? <laughs> I did not know that. I don't mean to, to tell you your business, but that's a horrible meal. It is. <laughs> So Appetite for Change is a nonprofit organization that uses food as a tool to create health, wealth, and social change in North Minneapolis. North Minneapolis is predominantly a black community. Once the white community members left, all our resource kind of left with them. It's like our grocery stores, our department stores, our clothing stores, all that just disappeared. 
most urban neighborhoods as well as low income areas. We already live in a food desert. Where I organized in Dayton, um, there was not access to an actual grocery store, you know, with fresh fruits and vegetables. The produce section, if you go to a bodega, it's, it's non-existent. It's gonna be like a box full of onions underneath the chips. It was a food desert. We have access to food. It's just not the right food that we have access to it. You could probably count out within a mile radius about 37 corner stores, fast food restaurants, fried chicken, fried fish. I mean, just overabundance of that right here within a mile radius. We don't live in a food desert. It's more like a food swamp. And I wonder to myself, like, why don't we deserve the best? So I made it my mission that my people have access to good and healthy food. What was school lunch like when you were in school? Everything was pre-made off-site. And it was the same thing all the time. The pizza, the hamburger, nah. no, I don't remember no vegetables. No vegetables. I remember them offering us no vegetables at school. We might got um, some mashed potatoes and whatever that gravy. It looked like hot ice cream. It was, yeah, hot and sandy. But I ate it. Yeah. With that in mind, then, how important is something like school lunch? That's very important because some kids in this neighborhood, that's probably be like the only meal that they get it. You know what I'm saying? It's that breakfast and that lunch. I was one of those kids that relied on breakfast and the lunch. People can hear your stomach growling. And it's just, it was very embarrassing of just like not being able to admit like I don't get food at home. So I have to rely on the school lunch. And the school lunch was bad today, so I couldn't eat. Do you see kids who are coming to school with like candy and chips and stuff like that? Oh yeah all the time. Some kids, it's their breakfast. I just see it so often, it's kind of like normal to me. Like now that I think about it, it's, it's pretty intense. If that might be their only way to get breakfast. That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to blow your mind, Kobe. <laughs> hey, I'm willing. It sounds like, <laughs> sounds like you think I'm gonna offer you drugs. No. <laughs> I'm not, I mean, I'm not gonna offer you drugs. Not on camera. There are far too many children who only get a meal at school for us to not be concerned with food justice. The National School Lunch Program serves about 30 million children. About 75% of those kids qualify for free or reduced price lunches. School lunch is hugely important for all kids. These meals are really impactful, but we don't really treat them with the respect that they deserve. What are those meals? There are five components for a school lunch. So you're always going to have a bread and a protein, fruit, vegetable, and milk. So you'll see things like chicken nuggets and pizza a lot because guess what? It combines a bread and protein into one convenient little package size. Prepackaged trays of food like this that can be heated up quickly make it easier to serve hundreds of people at once, whether that's in a school or on an airplane. Guess where I got this one? Go on, guess. If you think this food came from a school, touch here. And if you think it came from a plane, touch here. <laughs> oh, you're wrong. It's from a prison. Also, thanks for your fingerprints. These peel and heat meals, they can look so similar because airline food and prison food are often outsourced to similar kinds of private companies that prepare meals in bulk. Companies that over the past few decades have gotten involved in school cafeteria programs as well. And that's because the National School Lunch Program is a $13.6 billion business, which if I'd have known that when I was in middle school, I would have traded in my fruit roll-ups for actual cash bought some square pizza stock, and wound up the world's most malnourished billionaire. <laughs> the problem is that instead of just worrying about providing quality food to kids, private companies may have other priorities. That could be how national standards, like a school meal must have a bread and protein, can become a chicken nugget that if you microwave it for too long, might become a mozzarella stick. One of the issues with these companies is that they're trying to sort of squeeze out profit from what is a not-for-profit program. So they have to do that somehow. They can only sort of cut costs so much in terms of what the food looks like. So that really leaves labor. So the private management companies tend to underpay workers and also, um, I, I would say, have like a more rapid rate of turnover. So again, this idea of cheapness, so not necessarily what's going to be healthiest for the kids or create good jobs and communities, but what is sort of going to be like cheapest in terms of satisfying like the bare minimum. Are there cities, districts that are doing something that 
seems like a step in the right direction. Minneapolis is one of my favorite examples to talk about in terms of school lunch reform because- Then it's convenient that we're here. Yes. Six years ago, um, Bertrand Weber um, came um, to Minneapolis Public Schools and he was really recruited because he had a different approach, a different food philosophy. It was rooted in this idea of cooking from scratch and doing as much local sourcing as possible. I was the general manager of a five-star boutique hotel. But my son was seven years old and was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and I became the pissed-off parent. Okay. Because in the lunchroom, everything they were serving him is exactly what he didn't need to have. So you were like an angry soccer dad. Yep. But instead <laughs> of yelling at the coach, you were yelling at the school to make sure that they were apples. Yeah, absolutely. What I came into was 72 schools that were not cooking. We were just reheating prepackaged food. How did you change things? What did change look like? So I wanted to reach out to the local food community to look at how can I work with you guys? So we have a garden to cafeteria program where the kids grow the food, we pay them for it, and then we put it on the salad bar. Our farm to school program, we're currently contracting with 14 farms, local vegetable grower, local turkey farmer, and so on and so forth. It's clear when you work with Bertrand that he, he sees the big picture. He's been out on my farm several times. Invited, he hasn't just like shown up. No, thinking no, he I could haven't just... found him out, you know, uh, peeking across yeah. a big squash plant. Yeah, just like... <laughs> my name is Ray Rusnak, and I am a farmer, owner of L and R Poultry and Produce. Uh, as you can see right here, I have a very large squash, and it weighs about 17 pounds. Uh, a produce manager told me once that she thought large vegetables like this were too big of a commitment, but in the schools we bring in a squash like that and they're very happy because they're going to peel this thing and they're going to be left with a tremendous amount of usable flesh going to give them a lot of bang for their buck those kind of partnership are win-win for everybody this sounds really great but i'd imagine it's incredibly expensive whole foods not as expensive as processed food then why don't more school districts do it because now you also have to learn how to cook. So no, it's not more expensive, but it requires a lot more work. Work like building a kitchen, sourcing ingredients from local farms, and convincing skeptical teens that an eggplant is an actual food and not just an emoji dick. That's often why schools are reluctant to do this. And initially, it can be expensive to equip a kitchen, hire staff, train them to cook, and also teach them the eggplant thing. Look, if there's anything you take away from this season, it should be that we have to reclaim the eggplant as a food and not a digital penis. I just want to be inside you. Damn it, eggplant, you are not helping this. The point is, Bertrand was able to use the money he saved buying fresh bulk ingredients instead of prepared food to help cover the extra costs of labor so Minneapolis public schools don't have to spend more to provide healthier, fresher food. How long have you worked in the public school system? About 26, 27 years. Like when I first came in the system, it was pretty much pre-packed, so we were just really heating. What was that like when everything changed? Um, I was resistant to the change. Really? I was. Why? I didn't have any special training, so I was, I was kind of worried about that. Bringing the staff along was, was hard. I made some mistakes. And I think the, the main reason was, how do you tell someone who's been doing, in their mind, a great job for 20 years, that we're gonna change everything because what we've been doing was wrong. We had to really change our focus on training, uh, how to read recipe, how to order whole food, how to cook. Now we're cooking from scratch. You take pride in what you put out to the kids now. Not only would you serve breakfast free for everyone, and then we have the lunch, but we're now providing suppers for a lot of kids that, again, 
otherwise might just have a bag of chips for dinner. Dinner is held after school, and I know that's some kids' only dinner that they get, uh, so it's very important to them. The urban areas don't have the same access to this kind of food. That is something that I really enjoy about working with Minneapolis, knowing that my food isn't just being eaten by a wealthy suburban family. Kids, of all people, should be eating the best food that our country can provide. Bertram came in, was like, the food need to change here. You did get some pushbacks from the kids. I was like, we don't need salads. <laughs> we don't even know what this is on this salad bar. Just one kid who's just drinking blue cheese dressing, and I was like, <laughs> I'm fine. For so many kids who maybe don't grow up with those foods in their neighborhood, how do you get them to venture out and try these things? So the buying comes from having food that tastes really good and balancing it out with their all-time favorite. You know, we still have pizzas, we still have burgers, and then here's a roasted chicken drumstick with fresh mashed potatoes. Is pizza still popular? Still number one. But a child who doesn't eat the lunch is very expensive because I don't get any revenue. Just like in a restaurant, an empty seat is the most expensive thing a restaurant can have. I always thought the most expensive thing a restaurant could have is a bartender with a cocaine problem. Because they're just uh, coked out and they're just like, you get a shot, you get a shot, shots for everybody. Ah. Well, that could be too. When, when you're not used to something, it's easy to convert to your norm. When I became a vegetarian, I went through a little struggle. People started talking about me. It's like, oh, black people ain't vegetarians. You're trying to be white. She's but too good people, for bacon. Exactly. So even my daughter, she would come home and she'd be like, food wasn't up to her power because a lot of at that time she wasn't exposed to. Right. Like beets. We didn't eat beets at home. Did you grow up eating beets? No, nah, I haven't even learned to tell uh, like what a beet was until last year. Really? Yeah. Not, my family never grew up eating beets. They just grew up eating what they what, what, like. Normally everybody eats like spaghetti, tacos, like just all of that. Are there things that were like introduced to your diet that you'd never eaten before? One thing that they made, it was like a mango chicken thing. No one liked it, but I liked it. Everyone Probably. else was just throwing in the trash and you yeah, like, were sitting by yourself in the cafeteria like, I don't know what their problem is. <laughs> exactly, this is good. To me, if I reach one more kid today than we did yesterday, we're going the right direction. Yeah. So we do a taste test three or four times a year. And the purpose of the taste test is really to introduce kids to new flavors and textures. In this case, pumpkin hummus. So we paired it with a watermelon radish. Mmm, hummus. I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm not a hummus guy. Not everybody's gonna like everything, but at least introducing them to it is what's important. Yeah, tell that to my producer who was like, no, no, I want to see you eat hummus on camera. She didn't let me eat for two days. I had the opportunity to go to one of our grade schools to do a food test, and I'm like, Look at these little old black kids eating Harris hummus. That's what I'm talking about. That's most definitely of my mission, to expose them to good, healthy foods. There are a lot of parents who will tell me, I, I used to make lunch for my son or daughter because I wasn't happy with the school lunch. But now what they're getting at lunch is far better than I would make. I so, can really fuck up a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, so thank you. Sometimes I'll tell them, you know, you got to try it. Try different things to know if you like it. Yeah. And so if, if it's something I like or if a kid asks me my opinion, I will tell them my opinion. Right. But I'm like, you try it and you tell me what you think. I'm not a hummus person. I'm not either, but it was really good. That's something that I eat now. I'll eat hummus. Really? Uh-huh. Yeah, because has... they introduced it through the uh, taste test. Before then, I wasn't eating hummus, but I'll eat it now. Yeah, no, I'm still not eating it. You got to try it. Mm. Be adventurous. Is this what you tell the kids? Yes. Do you sell them just like you're trying to sell me? Some of them buy it. <laughs> <laughs> what is it like going to a cafeteria where there's a kitchen and they're making food? It's honestly really cool. I like to know like what I'm eating, and the fact that they know what I'm eating is 
cool. The cafeteria workers are like super nice. A lot of the cafeteria workers, when they look out at the cafeteria, they see their kids, right? Like oftentimes they really come to care about. I've heard cafeteria workers tell me like, they might be the very first person um, that a kid tells that they're pregnant, for instance, like before the kid even tells their parents. The point is that they're like an initial adult that the kid feels comfortable talking to. Frankly, uh, the adults in the school whom I could relate the most to were the cafeteria worker. There's like this black acknowledgement when you're in white spaces. So when I would be in line, it was the look that they would give me. It was how they would call me sugar or baby and they didn't necessarily talk to the white kids like that. It was just an understanding like, I see you. There's one lady I kind of got a connection with me and her are both native, and I was like, hey, are you native? And she's like, yeah. And I said, what are you? I said, are you Ojibwe? And she said, yeah. And I was like, cool, same here too. And so like every day when I'd grab lunch on her side, it'd be like, boujou, and boujou is like, hi. Miss Josie was was the woman who cooked in our, in, in our, in our cafeteria. Miss Josie was an educator, but she also had the conversations that I'm talking about we wouldn't have in our classrooms. For many kids of color, cafeteria workers are often among the few adults they see at a school that look like them. And the relationships that cafeteria workers have with the millions of kids who are on free and reduced lunch, those are also meaningful when you consider how providing quality food can bring a dignity to meals that can otherwise be a source of self-consciousness. I'm thinking back to a few weeks ago in West Virginia. I met this woman, Hillary, and while we were talking about the teacher strikes, she mentioned the impact school lunch had for her. When we were young, we were both on the free lunch program and like... You remember your, your cafeteria workers? Like these older women who just made the best food. It was all made from scratch when I was in school. Oh, yeah. wow. My siblings and I still talk about it. Like, really? Yeah. One's name was Ruby. Um, Miss Bean. Peggy. Yeah, I guess I do remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have the opportunity right now to be creative about how we benefit multiple systems when we pay attention to what happens in schools. We can be thinking about how to support farmers and local industry. We have the food, we have the farm. If we created more ways to connect the farm to the kitchen, to the table, to the student, I just think we're broadening again, like the student's conception of what it means to put food in their bodies. I think we have a moral obligation to reintroduce them to what food really is. I mean, it's not rocket science. The work that Bertram is doing in the Minneapolis Public School is in line with the work that I'm doing out here in the community. With Appetite for Change, Community Cooks Nights, we have those six times a month. So we try to do a full course meals for the community, but they cook it. We set it up buffet style. So they sit down and they talk. It's because I want them to understand that you deserve more than just chips, pops, and this in your store. You deserve to have the best food as possible, no matter what community, no matter what color, no matter none of that. That's the hard work here. It's getting everyone, schools, parents, and communities to see that they're all worthy of healthy food options. But maybe before some of that hard work starts, you let me unload some of these fruit roll-ups. Just saying, I'm a little overextended here. I really thought this was gonna be my Bitcoin. I mean, think about it. Like, you have my business card. fingers aren't strong enough. Oh, you can do look it. at that. Oh, uh, so you've been, you've been eating your vegetables. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can never palm a basketball, but I can palm a bowl of carrots. <laughs>